like a David Cronenberg monster, the myth that we only use 10% of our brains just won't die. It's so pervasive that school teachers have been known to regurgitate it to their students, which really hits home because I can recall several science and math teachers throughout my life that actually said this. Since Hollywood and other outlets just love to push this myth, back in 2011, we got a film called Limitless, starring that one guy from the Hangover movies that isn't Ken Jeong, and the Scarlett Johansson-led movie, Lucy. Both films follow individuals that have the full potential of their brains unlocked as a primary basis of the story. We're going to be talking about the common misconceptions surrounding the brain, including this one, and debunking them. But first, be sure to like, comment your favorite movie with bad science, smash that subscribe button, ring that bell, check out the Patreon, and share this video to all of your nerdy friends. I'm Eric Malachite, author of the cyberpunk novel Ego Trip, and this is Science Get. What's funny about the 2014 film Lucy is Professor Samuel Norman, the character played by Morgan Freeman. The professor tells the viewer that he's based his entire career around the idea that humans only use 10% of their brain power. This is kind of hilarious to me because it basically invalidates the entire movie, and using actual science to craft the story would have made for a much better film, at least in my extremely humble opinion. While this myth is thought to have had its origin in the early 1900s, some historians point to a quote by William James in his 1908 book, The Energies of Men, in which he says, We are making use of only a small part of our possible mental and physical resources. But it's important to note that James was speaking figuratively to the societal issues of the time, not about a specific characteristic of the human brain. Still, it's hard to believe that a simple misunderstanding of a quote could have launched this myth into the stratosphere, and most experts agree that the average person in the early 1900s misunderstanding neural research is a likely factor. Brain imaging scans clearly show that nearly every part of the brain is used, unless that person happens to have brain damage. And even then, it's important to note that a large portion of brains that have had significant damage are still very active. And we're not even talking about complex tasks either. These scans are typically taken when the subject is talking, walking, or doing any other normal mundane activity. There isn't a single part of the brain that can be damaged without that trauma resulting in serious consequences. And as we all know, nature is pretty efficient. It would make no sense for humans to evolve such a large brain if only 10% of the thing were being used. In fact, brain imaging techniques have yet to find a single area of the brain that serves no purpose. And yet, this will likely not stop the uncountable number of motivational speakers, Hollywood producers, MLM gurus, and even teachers from citing this myth as though it's fact. Like the Fast and Furious films, it's just too popular to die. But it's not the only misconception we hold about the brain. This is a misconception that my art school instructors hammered into me. Yes, I went to art school. Look at how I used all the knowledge I obtained through it to draw tentacle monsters. It's the idea that left brain people are more analytical and good at math, and right brain people are more artistic and creative. Now, while it is true that certain parts of the brain are observed lighting up when certain tasks are performed, no one is 100% left-brained or right-brained. This misconception comes from actual research that was then distorted and misrepresented. Roger W. Sperry was the progenitor of the theory of left and right brain dominance. Sperry studied the brain activity of epilepsy students who had had their corpus callosum, the structure that supports the two hemispheres of the brain, surgically severed. Sadly for these patients, complications arose after their surgeries. Remember how we said that no part of the brain can be damaged without serious consequences? Well, the corpus callosum acts as a means for the left and right hemispheres of the brain to communicate with each other. Without this connection, patients found it difficult to name objects that were associated with one hemisphere or the other. Based on these results, Sperry came to the conclusion that language processes were handled by the left side of the brain. Today, we know that a large portion of the left hemisphere definitely handles language and the right hemisphere deals with spatial and visual comprehension. But later research showed that the brain is not nearly so simple as Sperry thought. 
A common claim is that math and logic are typically handled by the left brain, but research shows that patients are more proficient in math when they can use both hemispheres of the brain in tandem. While this popular myth might not seem harmful, it does put people in boxes. Take me, for example. I'm a content writer, illustrator, author, and science communicator. While my math skills aren't what they used to be, I showed high aptitude for it before moving on to things that interested me more. Because I am a giant unmedicated blob of ADHD here. Yay. If the left or right brain myth were true, someone like me probably shouldn't exist, but that is pure speculation. Yes. Yes, I'm speculating. Yeah, okay. In other words, maybe don't put people in boxes. Okay, I'm done being motivational. Back to the myths. If you can't tell, I'm a big fan of beer. A big fan. It isn't hard for the average person to figure out that drinking alcohol leads to cognitive impairment, slurred speech, and limited mobility. A common misnomer is that consuming three beers will result in the death of 10,000 brain cells. And while this may not be the most harmful myth as alcoholism is a serious problem, it is still inaccurate. Alcohol consumption does not kill brain cells. It actually damages the ends of neurons though, so that's not great either. Neurons are responsible for electrical and chemical communication between the brain and other parts of the body, hence why your aunt loses the ability to walk or filter her opinions at Thanksgiving. Ethyl alcohol is an excellent antiseptic tool because it easily kills microorganisms and cells, but your body doesn't really allow this stuff to circulate through the rest of your system, limiting what it can affect. The liver converts this ethyl alcohol into the highly toxic acetaldehyde before turning that into acetate before it is finally broken down into water and carbon dioxide before being <clears throat> eliminated from the body. The liver can only process so much of that alcohol though, so when your aunt pounds several of those wine glasses back, the alcohol that awaits processing ends up lingering in her bloodstream, circulating all over the body until the liver is freed up to process more. What's really interesting about this is that while alcohol consumption definitely doesn't kill brain cells, it does interfere with the communication between dendrites, which are the branching connections at the very end of neurons. This is primarily seen in the cerebellum which of course handles motor controls. In fact, it's been observed that the effects of alcohol on neurons can lead to the production of steroids that prevent the formation of memories. So the next time your aunt wakes up in the morning, unable to remember how she threw a shoe at your Uncle Brian for the horrible things he said about the latest MLM craze she's been trying to sell, She's probably not lying. Also, MLMs are horrible. Additionally, alcohol itself was found to not cause neuron death in alcoholics who had a brain disorder called wernick karsakov syndrome. Instead, it was caused by a B1 or theamine deficiency and general poor health and nutrition, which is something that is closely associated with alcohol dependency. No surprise there. But what's more surprising is that moderate alcohol consumption was found to not only not kill brain cells, but evidence from various studies actually showed that such moderate consumption could actually reduce the risk of cognitive decline and developing dementia. So raise those glasses, fellow beer lovers, and drink responsibly. In the next part of this series, we'll be talking about learning styles, whether or not your brain has 100 billion neurons, and whether or not we humans do have the biggest <clears throat> brains. What did you think I was gonna say? If you dug this video, be sure to drop a like and comment your favorite part of the brain. Be sure to smash subscribe, ring that bell to never miss an episode of Science Get, and check out my Patreon where you can get early access to Science Get videos, short science fiction, horror, and dark fantasy stories, serialized novels, audiobooks, and your name in the credits. I'm Eric Malachite, and I'll see you next time.